Good morning. We're delighted to welcome you to a discussion of a wonderful new book focused on diplomacy in a turbulent world, which has been compiled and edited by Pamela All, Chuck Crocker, and Fen Hampson. This book is an important contribution to the field of conflict resolution and couldn't come at a better time. We all know that international relations are shifting. They're no longer primarily about managing threats to a well-understood balance of power, but now also about managing the realignment of power and addressing threats to the planet, ending humanitarian catastrophes, including pandemics. In the face of climate-induced scarcity, the rise of aggressive middle powers, the continuing presence of violent extremist movements with broad reach, and regional swings toward authoritarianism, we need to embrace new methods of diplomatic collaboration. The days when it was enough to dispatch an envoy to conduct closed door negotiations with a few elites are close to being over. The contributors to this volume are helping us to rethink how we do diplomacy to face these new challenges, whether it's competitive and instrumentalist diplomacy, stabilization diplomacy, or governance diplomacy. At the U.S. Institute of Peace, we're contributing to new directions in diplomacy, including by stepping up efforts to build strategic stability with Russia and China, working with partners to address the intersection of climate change and conflict, and promoting new forms of soft power, including through the congressionally mandated establishment of a new Gandhi King Global Academy. We're delighted to host today's discussion, and we look forward to hearing from this impressive group of experts. We invite everyone to engage with us during the conversation on Twitter using hashtag Diplomacy for Tomorrow. I'm very pleased to hand over to Dr. Chuck Crocker, the James Schlesinger Professor of Strategic Studies at Georgetown University and the former chair of USIP's board. Well, thank you very much, Lise. I'm delighted that uh, you were hosting this, that USIP is hosting this event. Our purpose, as you said, is to, is to discuss some of the ideas in this new book, uh, Diplomacy in the Future of World Order. Um, it's not formally a book launch, but more of an idea launch. But we're okay uh, if somebody wants to look at the book and see what it looks like, that's what it looks like, and you can buy it anywhere you choose where you buy your books regularly. Um, so <clears throat> the biggest idea, in a way, in this, in this, uh, this discussion is to explore the future of what we call peace and conflict diplomacy. We use this term in the book, and all of the authors addressed it and made contact with the term uh, to encompass uh, three major uh, diplomatic arenas. The first is managing great power competition and potential confrontation. The second is managing other people's conflicts. So that's a second kind of peace and conflict diplomacy where major actors like the UN or the US or the EU decide to engage on a problem, a specific problem like Libya or Kashmir. Um, and the third type is managing threats uh, to the international system itself. We are living through such a threat at the moment with the challenge uh, posed by COVID-19. This project began back in 2015, some time ago. It accelerated in 2016. We had author workshops with some of the authors as we were recruiting authors back in at 2017 and again in 2019. So it's been, it's been a long-term uh, process. And during this process, a lot of things have changed. I know that yesterday uh, at uh, USIP, there was a discussion of the uh, National Intelligence Council's uh, new report, Global Trends 2040. Well, a lot of those trends are important as uh, elements uh, of talking about uh, how, how peace and conflict diplomacy might work. I'm not going to repeat what's in the uh, <laughs> Global Trends 2040 account, but some of those trends are, are part of the backdrop, part of the environment for our discussion today. 
Um, and I think we need to keep them in mind. Trends like polarization, uh, trends like uh, the decline of authority and the rise of algorithms instead of experts. Uh, <clears throat> another trend is the, the decline of what I would call confidence building measures and stabilization measures in relationships between the United States and uh, our, major, our major rivals. Uh, uh, so the, the uh, issue of strategic stability is, is very important. Um, what's different about this project and what made us want to do it is that the book is not just uh, a bunch of talking heads sitting in Washington or New York or London or wherever. Uh, it's a global book. It's a global book that looks at the world through multiple lenses with authors from multiple regions who have expertise on multiple functional topics as well. And I'm proud to say that the, all the authors do not agree with each other, <laughs> and nor should they. Uh, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is to tease out a variety of views reflecting uh, the way people see the world evolving in different regions. So uh, we, we do not, in this, uh, in this volume, in this exercise, we do not uh, have a single model of the future. We don't have a, a sort of a unified prediction of the future. We have multiple scenarios, uh, and some scenarios are more likely to be prevalent in one region than another region. The three, the three broad scenarios, which uh, my, my friend and colleague, Fenn Hampson, will talk about in a moment, uh, relate to the, the, the possibility of return to kind of a Cold War geopolitical uh, situation, um, or uh, the opposite, which would be a return to the liberal rules-based order, uh, what we thought was the case until maybe 2015, 2016. And then there's a kind of a third option, which I guess could be summarized as variable geometry or a la carte multilateralism. I'll, I'll stop there so that uh, and let, let Fenn develop those, those ideas in a moment. Um, but we think that there are different kinds of diplomacy that relate to each of those scenarios. So under a scenario of geopolitical uh, confrontation, we're likely to see um, a, a more transactional um, opportunistic diplomacy, uh, which is, is purely tactical and looking at getting the best deal. So, for example, when President Bolsonaro of, of Brazil says that he'll save the rainforest if somebody else pays for it, uh, that's what, what I would call a transactional diplomacy. Or when former President Trump says that he might be in the market to buy Greenland, that's a, sort of a, transition, a transactional diplomacy. Uh, and there probably are other examples um, uh, telling Morocco that we'll recognize their sovereignty over the Western Sahara uh, if they uh, make nice with Israel and join the Abraham Accords. That's an example. Under the liberal rules-based order, we see a more values-based, governance-based type of, of diplomacy. For example, uh, doing what we can to try and salvage the Good Friday the Good Friday Accords in Northern Ireland to support the, their their survival despite all the tensions created by Brexit, um, trying to push on Venezuela to get improved governance in, in, in Venezuela, working for human rights uh, despite the challenges of the transition in Afghanistan. Uh, so those are uh, examples under governance, uh, governance diplomacy. I think there's also an international governance dimension to this as well, which we tease out and which we can all talk about. Uh, for example, the, the Paris Climate Accords uh, would be an example of that, or the JCPOA would be an example of that, where you're at the intergovernmental level, you're working on governance, uh, not at the internal uh, level inside of states. Under the third model, which we call, uh, to summarize it, variable geometry, our best hope, uh, I suppose, is a kind of a concert. Um, not a single concert, but um, uh, a concert uh, depending on the issue. So you could have concerts at the regional level, concerts at the functional level that are based on specific challenges, like, for example, climate or pandemics. The basic point about, about variable geometry is that you can sometimes arrange to have uh, cooperation without institutions, or maybe to put it better, cooperation inside and outside of institutions, so that it's, it's not either or, it's both. The bottom line, and this is my concluding point, is that diplomacy, 
as Lise has rightly said, is going to be uh, uh, a central challenge and a central requirement for the age that we are now entering. It'll be more important than ever. And we're going to need a diplomacy that is agile, that is networked laterally, that creates consensus around issues, around regional challenges, and around specific cases. Uh, so that's the kind of diplomacy we're going to need, and we're going to have to be able to connect with different kinds of actors, uh, official actors, multilateral actors, uh, non-official actors, and, and so forth. So uh, we're going to need to have some rules of the road on many different fronts. I think I'll stop there and turn the floor over to my friend and colleague and USIP Vice Chair George Moose to lead us forward and moderate our discussion. Over to you, George. Jeff, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, so uh elegantly setting the table for our panel discussion this morning. Um, there's a wealth of ideas in, in the book, and I appreciate your allusion as well to the, to the discussion we had yesterday of the, the National Intelligence Council's latest uh, Global Trends Report 2040, because there is con considerable con convergence, as you might well imagine, between the discussion we had yesterday and the discussion today, because the trends that we talked about yesterday, in fact, are the trends that are forcing the changes that we are seeing within the realm of conflict, peace and conflict diplomacy. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all this morning and to share the screen with uh, five distinguished international affairs experts. Um, each of our panelists uh, this morning has in one way or another significantly advanced the field of diplomacy, whether through diplomatic service, insightful research and scholarship, or both. And I would note that four of our panelists, Dr. Durso, Dr. Hampson, Ambassador Geheno, and Dr. Tan, have contributed chapters to the book that is the inspiration for today's discussion. So joining us today are Ambassador Barbara Bodine, Director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and Distinguished Professor in uh, Dist Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. She has over 30 years of experience in the U.S. Foreign Service, including as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Yemen. Dr. Solomon Derso is a chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. He previously served as adjunct professor of human rights at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Dr. Fen Hampson, one of the three co-editors of the book, is currently Chancellor's Professor at Carleton University and President of the World Refugee and Migration Council. He formerly served as the Director of the Norman Paterson School of International Affairs and as Director of the Global Commission on Internet Governance. Ambassador Jean-Marie Gehano is a Distinguished Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution and a member of the UN Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Board on Mediation. He previously served as President and CEO of the International Crisis Group and as Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations at the United Nations. And last but not least, Dr. C. Seng Tan is a tenured professor of international relations at the S. Rajaratnan School of International, Affair, uh, international Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He previously served as Deputy Director and Head of Research of the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies and founding head of the Center for Multilateralism Studies, both in Singapore. Uh, welcome to you all. Thank you all for joining us this morning and for be being willing to share your wisdom and insights into this question of the future of peace and conflict diplomacy. To get us started, I'd like to ask each of you to respond to what is, in, in fact, the initial framing question in the book, Diplomacy and the Future of World Order. And that question is this, uh, how is the practice of peace and conflict diplomacy changing? And what do you see as the most important implications of these changes? And, and I might add, of the trends outlined by both Lees and Chet in their opening remarks, which do you view as the most consequential for the practice of peace and conflict diplomacy? And let me begin with Dr. Hampson as one as, as one of the book's co-editors. Dr. Hampson, Fan. Thank you very much, George. And um, 
I also want to thank the United States Institute of Peace and its leadership for uh, organizing uh, this event to uh, discuss some of the ideas uh, in, in our book. Um, when it comes to uh, the future of diplomacy, to answer your question, uh, I think it's fair to say, and we do talk about this in the book, there are essentially three kinds of uh, diplomacy uh, that, uh, um, you know, characterize uh, uh, relations uh, between states. Uh, the first is what might be uh, called um, instrumental or competitive diplomacy. That's the diplomacy of developing spheres of influence and managing uh, alliances and so forth. Uh, the second is stabilization diplomacy, which is to uh, manage relations uh, to uh, de-escalate conflicts or to prevent uh, conflicts from uh, escalating. And the third is what might be called uh, governance diplomacy, uh, developing uh, new norms, uh, rules of, uh, of state behavior. Uh, some would argue that we're moving into a world of uh, uh, much more competitive or instrumental diplomacy. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that if we're going to manage great power relations, we're going to need uh, heavy doses of uh, stabilization diplomacy. That's the diplomacy of confidence building measures, uh, reviving uh, arms control, strengthening non-proliferation regimes and so forth. Uh, because uh, the risk of uh, uh, escalating great power conflicts is obviously uh, much greater uh, today than it was uh, in that unipolar moment uh, after uh, the fall of uh, communism. Um, we may uh, at the same time see less demand for governance diplomacy, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, changing the character or complexion of uh, uh, the institutions of states. I think that's just become a lot harder. That's uh, the diplomacy of uh, democracy building. Um, it's the diplomacy of, uh, of peace building. It's not to say that we don't need it, but uh, uh, there's a lot more pushback uh, to that in, uh, in the current environment. All right, thanks uh, for that uh, nomenclature we found to get us started. Uh, let me turn to Ambassador Bodine, who's, Barbara, you spent a lot of time in a part of the world where we've tried to practice stabilization diplomacy <laughs> with mixed results. <laughs> what would you say about the ways in which our, these approaches to peace and conflict uh, uh, diplomacy are, are changing and the, and the factors that are driving that change? Um. Well, first of all, thank you very much for including me in this panel and, and uh, enjoyed reading most of the book, haven't gotten through all of it. Um, I think, you know, we're all very much aware that um, President Biden has announced that diplomacy is back and multilateralism is back. Um, and I think my concern is that there are an awful lot of observers who think that we are going to hit a reset button and go backwards to a time uh, when the U.S. saw itself as indispensable and irreplaceable, um, and that you know we can go back into all these these various fora, and we will once again get the daddy chair and be in the lead. One of the things that happened over the last four years, and it was an acceleration of trends that were already occurring, is that the world moved on. Um, and one example of this is that when we pulled out of the TPP, uh, Korea, Japan, and Australia kind of went, okay, got together and moved it forward without us. And um, we teetered on the edge of moving from indispensable to irrelevant uh, in the world, maybe too big to ignore but not necessarily to be taken seriously and certainly not seen as reliable or consistent. So our place in diplomacy and our place in multilateralism has changed. Another major change, and again, accelerated, not uh, started over in the last administration, is that the world that a diplomat diplomacy operates in is far more complex than um, the textbook version of 
an ambassador talking to ministers and coming up with agreements or secretaries of state. Um, it's fragmented and it has become layered. Uh, there's horizontal, if nothing else, the number of states that are engaged in diplomacy has grown exponentially. Um, it also is vertical. It goes upwards to multilateralism, either ad hoc or institutional, a lot more mini-lateralism, Korea, Japan, and, and Australia, um, regional organizations and ad hoc coalitions. And then it goes downward to non-state actors. And these are not just terrorists. Uh, non-state actors include civil society, um, international advocacy groups, uh, international humanitarian groups, um, cities, and states, provinces, governance. Um, California, you know, you may recall when, when Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord, California very nicely said, well, that's great. We're still in it. Um, and <clears throat> whether or not that was entirely legal is a different issue. But a diplomat, diplomacy, all of these various scenarios need to be more than a three-dimensional chessboard. And any diplomat who just talks to his or her governmental counterpart is, is a very poor diplomat. Um, because of the change in how the world is now structured, um, diplomacy needs to be far more agile. It needs to be more flexible. It needs to be more adaptive consensus. Um, I'm not sure if it was ever truly possible to go into a, a, a government and say, by the way, I want you to do this. And the answer was, you know, yes, sir. Um, I think that the idea of the unipolar world was far more a figment of American imagination than anything any of us saw on the ground. But to the extent that we had that, we don't. Um, most of the issues that we also face are not amenable to military or other hard power. And so again, diplomacy is going to become the major tool, um, not the fallback, the default, the, the prelude and after, um, but it's going to have to be front and center. Um, I think the major challenge uh, is going of all of that that's that's outlined in the book is is nationalism um, and again this goes a little bit too we don't get the daddy chair back um, and some of this is 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 right and proper um, countries that states that 20 years ago 30 years ago uh, barely existed we're just coming out of colonialism uh, we're just coming out of poverty we're just emerging. Um, now have a generation or two of their own policymakers, their own elites, their own non-state actors, uh, their own social media, and um, they are defining their interests and deciding their tools, um, in many cases, irrespective of great powers. And um, what we have is kind of mini hegemony going on. Um, where the Turks, the Emiratis, and the Saudis are playing games, are furthering interest. I don't want to sound trivial, like I'm trivializing it. Um, have defined their interests and are going ahead and pursuing them in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, in other places, um, as they see in their interest. And they may or may not be in concert with our interests or Russia's or China's. And so as these states come into their own, they are going to be far more independent actors. And we are going to have to deal with them as actors and not as agents. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks very much. That's actually a good segue to Dr. Derso Solomon, mm -hmm. because in Africa, we in fact see a region which increasingly has uh, asserted its own role, agency, in addressing issues of uh, peace and conflict, uh, and indeed institutionalized within the African Union, 
with which you have been affiliated. And we also are seeing uh, the, one of the, the phenomenon that Barbara has just described, which is the increasing and, and increasingly intrusive role of other powers, both global and regional, in African affairs and the effects that that is having. So tell us how, how you see uh, that landscape of peace and conflict diplomacy changing and how, what's, what are the implications for Africa? Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Mood. And I wish to also join others in thanking the USIP um, for organizing this event, inviting me to be part of uh, the discussion, and also the editors uh, for uh, inviting me to contribute a chapter. Um, the changes that are uh, happening uh, in the world, particularly uh, those that you mentioned, uh, such as the um, global uh, big power competition um, has very serious repercussions uh, on the African scene uh, for a number of uh, factors. Uh, as you rightly said, um, since the turn of the century, uh, with the transition of the Organization of African Unity to the African Union, efforts have been underway to institutionalize peace and conflict diplomacy on the African continent uh, through establishing both uh, norms and institutions that uh, provide the framework for pursuing uh, peace and conflict diplomacy uh, on the African scene. Uh, and these have led to uh, most important developments uh, in the area of uh, the development of norms in this respect. Um, it's interesting to note the uh, appropriation of uh, the post-Cold War uh, normative developments in the international scene uh, and adapting them to the African uh, situation um, and the establishment also of institutions that are meant to advance, promote uh, and ensure the implementation or try to ensure the implementation of these norms um, these norms range from those relating to the promotion of human rights uh, to those of peace building and also uh, conflict prevention, um, as well as protection of uh, the life of uh, citizens, uh, particularly from some of the grave uh, dangers that the continent witnessed in the 1990s, including genocide uh, against the Tutsis in Rwanda, for example. Um, of course, these happened I think it's important to recall against the backdrop of uh, major developments. One has to do with um, the withdrawal of uh, international engagement uh, for uh, provision of peace and security on the African continent. Uh, what you know, the late uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan said, Africa was left to fend for itself, so to speak. And it is in that context that uh, member states, of course, a certain group of leaders uh, managed to mobilize others into transitioning the OU to the African Union. So, but this drew on and uh, sought to complement the global collective uh, peace and security architecture that's anchored in the United Nations Charter. So when there is big power competition, uh, paralyzing uh, collective action within the UN Security Council, and if that paralysis and competition spills into how African related issues are managed, then that directly affects uh, how these African issues are handled, uh, simply because uh, the decision making process uh, in the African Union uh, takes into account and relies on collaboration, coordination and support from the international system, whether that is the UN through the UN Security Council and the support that it provides, such as, for example, uh, the support package for the implementation of the African Union mission in Somalia by the United Nations, or the European Union through its Africa Peace Facility. These were critical support infrastructure necessary for implementing the African peace and security architecture. But if greater competition between big powers is going to shift 
attention away from and resources away from these engagements to other uh, more pressing quote unquote areas then that can affect the effectiveness of an already uh, struggling uh, peace and security architecture that is trying to stand on its feet um, of course admittedly i think the other issue that we feel concerned about is the possibility of any one of the conflict scenes being sapped into this big power competition, completely taking uh, the possibility of pursuing peace and security diplomacy with Africa's active engagement. And this has been seen, for example, in the scenario of what we have witnessed in Libya, uh, which is a very interesting example. It was not African actors that were at the lead, uh, at the forefront of uh, trying to establish peace, it's others. Um, and then those are the kinds of issues that uh, we feel concerned about. Thank you, Solomon. And your, your description of the connection, the interrelationship between regional architectures for peace and security and the international ones, I think is a useful one. And I think a good segue to uh, Ambassador Gehano. John Marie, you also have talked about in your chapter, you talked about the diffusion of power, the fragmentation in the way of power, the impact that's had on the international system. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about how you see this whole realm, this whole field of peace and conflict diplomacy shifting and the forces that are driving it in that direction? Well, thank you, Ambassador, for your question, and, and thank you also to the editors of the book for asking me to contribute a chapter. I mean, uh, like Barbara Bodin, I've not yet read the full book, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm right, I'm immersed in it, and it's, a, it's an incredibly rich book, which reflects the, uh, the complexity of the world we, we are now in, and, and that speaks to your, to your question. Uh, I think that during the Cold War, there was the kind of defining issue, or at least we thought that way. And during the post-Cold War period moment, there was a defining power, a group of power. Uh, now we have neither a defining issue, we have multiple issues, nor a defining power, no power or group of powers has enough uh, influence to really shape uh, the world. And that uh, really raises a question whether there can be any kind of international order without uh, the existence of such, uh, such a power. It's a question that uh, really challenges the United Nations uh, every day. And I think there is today is what I call a sense of loss of control, uh, that you see more and more that countries are inward uh, looking. And as a European, I look at uh, the European Union, which certainly has been a major actor in development aid, uh, not in strategic matters because it's not uh, unified enough for that, but uh, in other, in soft power, it has been a major player. But we see that uh, the European Union is more and more inward looking, uh, that, and that the COVID crisis increases that, I think, uh, all countries today look after themselves first. I mean, there is a sense of fragility uh, that uh, is per pervading, uh, I think, the international uh, arena. And uh, the ongoing uh, G7 uh, summit is not going to, uh, to change that, I I'm afraid. So what does that mean for, for diplomacy uh, in our world today? Uh, I think the optimism uh, and ambitions of the first uh, decade of this century uh, are gone. There is a much greater sense of the limitations of what uh, foreigners can achieve in helping uh, countries uh, stabilize. Uh, in some ways, this uh, newfound humility may be a good thing. Uh, because uh, there was the overconfidence uh, led to some big uh, mistakes. Uh, the sense that you can shape the life of others uh, is somewhat uh, dangerous. I mean, the peace in the hands of, is in the hands of those who have made war, and you cannot make peace uh, for, for them. So that humility, in a sense, is good. But in another sense, it's, uh, it's dangerous 
uh, if it leads to indifference. Uh, and today I'm struck by how, I mean, we, we have a horrific humanitarian situation in a number of places around the world. And frankly, uh, you see much attention given to them. No, uh, there's a, the, the great enemy today is indifference, uh, uh, a sense that let's try to address the issues at home before we address any all those issues of countries we know very little about. Does that mean that we should give up? I don't think so, but I mean that it, we should be much more nimble. Uh, as a previous speaker said, there are now um, a number of new actors uh, who are focused on one issue or another, and more and more we're going to have alliances between those actors in, on an ad hoc basis. I mean, uh, of the three scenarios uh, that uh, are described in the book, I, I definitely think the third uh, scenario of practical cooperation in an ad hoc way is, is the most likely, uh, most likely scenario. And I'm not talking there just of uh, uh, alliances between states. I, when I look, for instance, at a situation like Libya, we saw that the UN mission has worked with NGOs, uh, subcontracting, so to speak, uh, some aspect of the peace uh, process to, to NGOs. I think we're going to see more and more of those cross-cutting alliances between different types of actors. And so that's what will make the world resilient. Uh, it's not going to be big powers coming together and deciding what the future of the world is going to be. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. That top-down approach is, is gone for good. I think it will be much more of a horizontal uh, approach where actors who care about a particular issue will come together and, and make a, a little difference or a big difference, starting at the margin, but the addition of all those efforts can actually uh, be transformative. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Uh, let me um, invite uh, Dr. Tan uh, Sheng to talk, tell us how all of this relates to, um, to Asia and Southeast Asia, where the history, the tradition has been somewhat different. Um, many of the concepts that we've been talking about here don't seem to have been readily um, applied or evident in Southeast Asia. And I wonder what these trends in terms of conflict, uh, peace and conflict diplomacy suggest to you. Um, I think it's also fair to say that in, until fairly recently, conflict in Southeast Asia has been pretty well managed through whatever means, formal and informal. We now have a very notable exception to that, but can you help us understand what this these trends mean for arguably um, the most important uh, emerging part of, the, of our planet. Well, thank you, Ambassador Moose, and thank you to, to USIP uh, for involving me in this, in this um, excellent project. Uh, I, I just want to echo uh, a lot of the comments that, that my, my colleagues on this panel have already so very eloquently made. Um, uh, in, in, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, one of the big issues obviously is, is great power competition. And, and, and I uh, commend my, my, my colleague from, from Africa, for uh, Solomon, for, for highlighting, uh, you know, just the immense difficulties and challenges that, that his neck of the woods uh, you know, faced in terms of, of great power competition and, and, the, and, the, and the very same kinds of logics hold true uh, for Asia as well. Uh, great power competition has really raised the prospect of the major powers becoming spoilers uh, rather than providers and enablers of peace and security. And it's really just somehow compressed, I think, the strategic space that's available for Asian states, smaller states, to be able to exercise some freedom in terms of their foreign policy. Um, and so you hear the often increasingly very tired, but not retired mantra uh, that Asian countries would make of not wanting to be forced to choose sides uh, in this great power rivalry. And I think that's really stifled the ability, the opportunities uh, for uh, smaller countries in the region to exercise 
um, you know, diplomacy in, 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 in the ways that they have been normally accustomed to. So that, I think that's one of the major uh, challenges that, that, that we faced. Um, uh, the, the prospect, therefore, for um, um, regional actors, regional countries, regional organizations to, to rise up um, and, and, and uh, uh, exercise uh, some level of, of, of engagement in, 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 in assuming responsibility for for their region is 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 obviously very very important and significant, uh, and here I think uh, the attempts, therefore, by uh, regional organizations like ASEAN, uh, which we all know, you know, have have really just not been the most uh, um, proactive in terms of of taking responsibility for 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 their region. Uh, I think that that's. That's become very apparent now. I think uh, ASEAN is, is, is trying to level best. It's not doing all that it necessarily can at this point in time, but but I think uh, there the opportunity therefore for it to 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 do more uh, is certainly open. Um, um, a well, uh, what one of the uh, the uh, I, I guess one of the more prominent uh, diplomats uh, in in from my home country of Singapore um, uh, once described ASEAN. Uh, as essentially a cow that everybody expects to act like a, ho a horse. Uh, and so I guess that's one of the concerns that uh, you know, ASEAN is constrained and limited, not just in terms of institutional design, uh, but also in terms of, of, of its, its um, propensity, uh, at least as member states, to, to, to uh, uh, you know, collectively work towards uh, peaceful ends. I think it's it's trying to level best, uh, but uh, um, uh, national interests do get in the way. And so I think I think it, the, the the floor is wide open now for 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 institutions like ASEAN and and for uh, you know major uh, countries in, in the region to to work together col uh, collectively. Uh, but then again, you know I think the the the, the limitations and constraints are are are, are quite obvious. Uh, but uh, um, but e everyone needs to, to to try to figure out a, a way forward. Thank you. So, saying, I'm sort of going to start off our sort of next round of questions. But let me actually pick up on what you just said um, and ask you, invite you to share with us a bit more, a bit more of a reflection on. What, for example, the United States, a Biden administration, could do to help create a larger and more propitious space for regional actors, ASEAN and others, to be able to play a more effective, a larger, a more robust and more effective role with regard to peace and conflict diplomacy? Are there things that uh, the U.S. on the one hand might stop doing <laughs> that are <laughs> complicating your lives or alternatively things that the U.S. could do that would actually be supportive of a more robust role for regional actors with respect to peace and conflict diplomacy? Well, thank you for that. Um, I think the comments have already been made earlier on by, by my fellow uh, colleagues with regards to the United States, um, you know, um, coming back, uh, if you will. And, and, and we do take the cautionary notes that it's not going to be back to things as normal in the, in the past. Um, but I think for the region as a whole, uh, it very much welcomes um, uh, the Biden administration's assurance, if you will, that the United States will from henceforth uh, take very seriously its role and responsibility as a global leader, uh, and that it would uh, uh, play uh, a proactive role in encouraging, mobilizing the world, uh, and indeed even the Asian region to collectively work toward positive and peaceful outcomes. I think that message has been very well received by, by the region as a whole. Um, and I think that being said, it's, it's fair to say that, that the region also recognizes that strategic rivalry between the United States and China, that's a given, it's a fact, and, and it's gonna be ongoing. Uh, 
Uh, but at the same time, the region believes um, that cooperation is nonetheless possible between them. I, I do take the, the point that many American friends have made to me that is not exactly the easiest thing going forward uh, because uh, it's not for lack of trying on the United States part, uh, but our Chinese friends need to get their act together as well. Um, they need to um, accommodate, acknowledge and recognize that the U.S. Uh, has proprietary interests in the region as well, uh, legitimate interests, um, and as a residential power. So all of that being said, I think um, what uh, the Biden administration has, 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 has promised the region, uh, you know, that it will, in the midst of strategic rivalry with China, nonetheless still seek ways to cooperate with China. I think that's a message that the Asian region welcomes very, very strongly. Uh, and in that regard, I think it opens up possibilities for um, regional actors to come in uh, into, that, into that space and to help nurture um, uh, a great power relations uh, in, in ways that uh, would move the region towards a much more positive, peaceful ends. So I think what the United States is to doing today uh, I, I think is, is, is something that the region uh, strongly encourages. Thanks, Seng, for that. I, I, I want to pivot then to, uh, to Solomon on a very similar note or similar theme. Um, you know, as you've outlined, one of the successes of, you know, we often look to the African Union as kind of a model for the role regional organizations might play, can play, in this larger system of peace and conflict diplomacy. And one of the things you noted is that when it was designed, it was designed quite deliberately to be integrated with that international system, it was not separate and apart, but it was very much seen as part of that larger system. And part of that, of course, is uh, a, an expectation that that larger system would also um, be a provider of support and assistance when and where needed. And we, we know um, that um, the, the establishment, the standing up of major peace operations, for example, is something that's unreasonable to expect Africa to be able to do on its own. It's just, this is an area where it needs external support and assistance and, and guidance. But by the same token, uh, as we alluded to earlier, the, the coming, what comes with that external support and assistance is also the uh, sometimes um, um, less helpful interventions of those external actors. How can the African Union, what can the African Union do to condition the behaviors and the activities of some of those external actors so that they in fact are more supportive than and less disruptive that's a long-winded question but i think you know what i'm getting at um uh, thank you again uh, ambassador um i think th there is a similar sentiment as um, um uh, the one that is expressed in asia where uh, the sense here in africa is one that says we don't want to be forced into choosing taking sides. Uh, so that sentiment is very pervasive. Um, in terms of, you know, the most that we can expect from the role that the African Union uh, may play uh, in limiting uh, and also uh, perhaps uh, avoiding uh, some of the negative consequences of these developments is uh, the possibility of um, the African Union uh, taking leadership, uh, particularly in terms of taking initiatives for responding to uh, and um, uh, deploying uh, peace and conflict diplomacy. Uh, of course, uh, in a context where uh, the African Union is able to secure um, uh, a situation whereby uh, as has been the case, I think, for most part, uh, when it comes to African issues in the UN Security Council, uh, the tradition has largely been one of uh, 
uh, the various actors uh, supporting uh, initiatives of the African Union. Uh, and it was not a major area of uh, contestation. Uh, there were some flashpoints where that uh, contestation and division um, played itself out. Uh, but overall, uh, the, the trend has been one of uh, those uh, competing global powers uh, supporting. The challenge, however, is when the African Union is unable, unable uh, to uh, provide that kind of initiative on which international actors can uh, build in order to uh, craft a successful uh, conflict and peace diplomacy. So there are instances uh, where some of the developments, uh, such as, for example, uh, the, in the resort to invoking sovereignty, uh, it's increasingly, for example, shifting uh, the way uh, peace and conflict diplomacy is being debated in the African Union um, away from what used to be um, uh, a collective approach to one where uh, sovereignty is being invoked, uh, basically to lead to a situation where effective collective action is not uh, really taken. M many countries, including you know, uh, relatively bigger countries have increasingly become inward looking and as a result of that, and, and not only inward looking, but also they are themselves uh, tied by internal political and security challenge. And this has presented uh, its own set of challenges. Um, and in that, in that kind of scenario, uh, I think what you would end up having is the expectation that the U countries like the US necessarily uh, to engage, particularly when it comes to serious, when serious humanitarian issues are emerging and uh, for dealing with that and responding to that as uh, a result of conflict, if no collective action is taken at the African level, obviously um, there is expectation that uh, the US and other countries would, would step in at least to limit and contain uh, the excesses of the humanitarian situations. Thank you, Solomon. I'm going to come back to you in a while because I want to make this a little bit more specific and concrete because you're sitting in Addis Ababa right now. Um, at the heart of, I think, what is arguably the most threatening current conflict situation on the continent. I want to invite you a little bit later on to talk to us about how that African peace and conflict architecture is being applied or ought to be applied in the situation and how it ought to link to external actors, the United Nations, individual countries, et cetera. But let me, at this point, uh, Jean-Marie, um, putting on your old peacekeeping hat, <laughs> Um, you know, th th there seems to be at least some sort of a consensus that peacekeeping is and will continue to be a useful tool, notably, I guess, in Africa, but perhaps elsewhere. And interestingly enough, th there seems to be, you know, despite all of the disagreements between the U.S. and China, there does seem to be some shared understanding between the two. As respect as regards to to peacekeeping, China's increasing role in peacekeeping. I recently participated in a session with Chinese uh, experts on multilateralism who suggested that peacekeeping indeed might be an area of cooperation, one of the few in this current era of contestation between the US and China, and that potentially uh, it could in help help to minimize, mitigate the. Uh, and perhaps even resolve some of the conflicts that we see on the African continent. I wonder what your thoughts might be on that. How do you see the future of peacekeeping and, and this potential for peacekeeping becoming an area of, of US-China cooperation, at least to a degree? 
Well, I, I think the the big multidimensional missions that had the ambition of really reshaping a country, that's probably not uh, going to happen. That That's over. But at the same time, I completely agree with you that all the big powers don't want states to collapse. Uh, the, if there is any hope for international order, it's still based on functioning states. And so efforts to, to shore up states as the bricks of, in, of an international order, they will continue. And in that respect, you do need, in some cases, uh, a real force. Uh, the notion that you can just solve everything uh, through nice political agreements uh, is wrong. Uh, indeed, peacekeeping without a political process is bound to fail. Uh, but uh, a political agreement that does not have a re the reassurance of a force to back it, so that it elevates the threshold for potential spoilers, that's a very fragile uh, political agreement. So I do think that there is a future for peacekeeping operations. What may be significantly different uh, from the past, in my view, is that more and more we are going to see a juxtaposition of force rather than just one force on a particular theater. I mean, the Sahel is a good illustration of that, where you have the uh, peacekeeping mission of, in Mali, the MINUSMA, uh, you have the G5, the forces of the regional countries, uh, and you have the French uh, force, and you had some uh, uh, US uh, uh, special, special forces. So you have a combination of forces, and how those forces can work together that's going to be more and more, I think, the operational question that will need to be resolved. But I, I agree that the Chinese uh, will, will not want Africa to become uh, a place where there are big spots that would not be under the control of, of a state. They have a major investment uh, in Africa. They don't want that investment uh, to, uh, to be lost. Uh, because of uh, spreading uh, chaos. So there will be political support for some transformed peacekeeping. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. I'm sure Lise will appreciate that too, because she too, the, the U.S. Institute of Peace, is banking on the hope that indeed, precisely in situations like this, the U.S. and China might find ways, there might be a convergence of interests and, and, and actions that would lead to um, efforts to create greater stability and over the longer term peace uh, on the African continent and elsewhere. Um, Barbara, how does all of this <laughs> relate to a world, the uh, part of the world that you know very, very well from your extensive experience and which is, I would argue, one of the most conflict prone areas <laughs> of the world. And what lessons um, can we, we we draw here about the possibilities of regional conflict management and conflict management diplomacy, um, given such really difficult charges and cases as Libya and Syria and Yemen? I, I would note that back in 2011, the Arab League actually, as I recall, came out in favor of an intervention in Libya. Um, to stabilize the post-Gaddafi era. That didn't last for long for reasons which I think we know, but nevertheless, it was an interesting indication of a potential for regional diplomacy. I wonder what you think that potential might be today, if any. Um, you just took my opening line. I'm not sure there's much at all. Um, Listening to to my colleagues uh, saying and and Solomon in particular, um, there is no regional architecture in the Middle East. It simply does not exist. The Arab League has been a hollow organization, possibly its entire life. But with the Arab Spring taking uh, Egypt. Syria, Iraq, um, out of the Arab League, um, whatever whatever Arab League there was, effectively ceased to exist. 
Um, the GCC for a while was kind of the default Arab League. Um, those were the only states that were still standing and they certainly had the money. Um, the GCC, of course, imploded um, uh, for a very long time. Um, a very small organization of six states had two different halves um, and almost at war with each other. So there are not the regional organizations that can do conflict management. Um, and in fact, I would, I would flip the question and, and say that the regional players are the major source of conflict in the region. Um, they are, you know, if it's nationalism or sovereignty or um, their own definition of their, both their political and commercial interests, um, it is the regional actors who are driving uh, Libya, um, are driving Yemen, uh, and are driving Syria in many ways. Uh, Syria is the only one where you really have the Russians playing a, a sort of major role. But the problem in the Middle East is, I, I would say as a start, it's very hard to even define the Middle East. Um, Iran is a Gulf state but it's not part of the GCC because they're Persians, not Arabs. Um, North Africa sees itself as, as separate, neither African nor Arab or some combination of both. Uh, and the Eastern Mediterranean states are having their own problems. What you have in the Middle East is, is almost, <sighs> you can pretty much go across the Middle East and see state collapse. Uh, Lebanon um, is, is a failed state at this point. And so looking to regional actors to help with conflict management is you're, you're, you're asking the arsonist to come and put out the fire. Um, part of why have they become so aggressive for, for a very long time, except for Iraq, who invaded at least three of its neighbors um, at some point or another, um, they tended to stay within their own borders. We would certainly, we certainly had problems with the nature of the regimes, but they weren't um, externally aggressive. And over about the last 10 years, starting with the Arab Spring, um, Saudi Arabia in particular, the Emirates to a very large extent, a few others have become far more the aggressors in trying to stabilize the region the way they think it should be stabilized. And it's a very top-down, very military um, type of effort. Um, and none of the other states really play very much. Um, Part of also what I think drove them, and you asked this question earlier and I didn't quite get to it, is our own role in this, uh, particularly um, our efforts at democratization. Uh, we, Iraq is a failure. Iraq was a failure as soon as we went in um, because we had, in a sense, um, adopted the trope of the military coup that comes in and says, once we have the country stabilized, we will return it to democracy. But they never quite get it stabilized in their terms, and we, you never get a return to democracy. And we went in with a military force, and we said, once we have Iraq secured, uh, then it can move into democracy. Well, if you lead with security first, you end up with security only. And we never got to democratization um, or to the extent that we tried or thought we were doing it. Um, we had a very structural definition of democracy. We didn't look at local patterns, local culture, local um, if I heard one more me member of the military talk about how Arabs can't do democracy because they don't have a sense of compromise, something that is sorely lacking here now, but the, they don't have compromise, yes. But in the Middle East, you have a strong sense of consensus, work with that. Mm -hmm. So we try to securitize and then structurally democratize a region and it has been a failure. 
another reason that many of the states in that region have now taken matters into their own hands, not in a way to stabilize it. There is nothing going on in Libya that is a stabilization effort. There is nothing that is going on in Yemen that is a stabilization effort. But it is their attempt to shape their own environment in a way that they think will serve their interests, economic and political and values. So we don't have anyone to work with. Uh, and we are not, we are not welcome in many ways. Um, and we have a lot of relationships that um, there's been increasingly open discussion that we need to recalibrate our relationship with Israel. We need to recalibrate our relationship with Saudi Arabia. And in a sense, we need to recalibrate our relationship with Iran. Those are going to be long-term and major uh, efforts before there can really be any effort at de-escalating these horrific um, the Palestinian issue, the Syrian issue, the Libya issue, the Yemen issue. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, sorry. You, no, 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 not at all. Because you, you, you in, in some respects, uh, that part of the world, that Middle East, ill-defined, undefinable Middle East, uh, is strikes me as being perhaps the most fraught. Because not only do you have the contestation between and among regional powers, you have a total absence of consensus amongst external actors and uh, behaviors on the parts on the part of those external actors, which if anything are contributing to the internal, the, the region's fragmentation and contestation and conflict. Um, so whereas one can see some possibilities, for example, in Africa of, um, uh, a, uh, a like-minded states coming together to stabilize countries. I don't readily yeah. see that. See that in in the Middle East. Would that be uh, fair? I, yeah, if I can. Yeah, um, there is there. I, I, I think it was John Ray who 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 brought this up. But um, the situation in the Middle East is marked primarily by indifference. Mm -hmm. um, you can't ignore the Middle East. It won't let you. Um, yeah. But there is great indifference. You know, we we don't really want to be engaged there if we don't have to. Uh, the EU isn't really engaged there. China is not in the Middle East, maybe yet, yeah. but it's not there. Um, and the Russians are in Syria, Libya. Yeah. Um, but they don't really have, they do not have a traditional relationship with any of the states there, except for the Syrians, um, that they can, they can build on. Um, the, the Arab world does, doesn't see the Russia as a regional player. Hmm. Um, the Chinese, because they are such major consumers of Gulf oil and gas, May, maybe, um, but they can't offer the Belt and Road construction projects, which they can in Africa, to large parts of the Middle East because they can do that themselves. They can do it themselves. Yeah. So yeah. how exactly the Chinese are going to try to play in the Middle East, I don't know. The Russians don't really have a foothold there. And we have become increasingly disenchanted with our ability to do anything effective and are seen as ineffective. And the EU's role seems to be mostly stop the refugees. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's, um, as you say, a, a region of the world at the moment is characterized both by contestation and indifference. Um, yeah. <laughs> hard to know where to go. Let me, Finn, if I might, let me come back to you. Be, um, because in your chapter in the book, and, and, and you've written elsewhere, um, you explore what you describe as this concept of international concerts as an approach to conflict management. 
um, and particularly given the increasingly multipolar character of our world. And this is not totally frivolous, but in what ways uh, is this concept similar to or how does it differ from the old 19th century version of the concert? But I guess more relevantly, you know, what, what, how do you envisage, how do you imagine these concerts? Uh, who conducts them? Um, where and under what circumstances might they be relevant and effective in dealing with our current agenda of peace and conflict diplomacy? Well, I will uh, resist the temptation to give uh, Kissingerian style uh, lectures in history, George, but um, the, uh, the 19th century uh, uh, concert uh, uh, had two variants, uh, I think, uh, as we all know, the first which emerged after the Congress of Vienna, uh, uh, and, and that uh, was following the uh, French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and the second after the unification of Germany. But in both cases, the concert involved ad hoc gatherings of Europe's key leaders uh, to uh, discuss their differences and ensure they didn't get out of hand by developing uh, rules of the road uh, for state behavior to maintain the territorial status quo uh, and the balance of power. Uh, it was called a concert, uh, not because of what uh, the key actors did, but uh, uh, as some of you may know, because they, uh, at the Congress of Vienna, the evenings were spent uh, attending musical events, and that's where the idea of concert uh, originated. Um, uh, it was not so much a gathering of friends, though, but a team of rivals who uh, understood in a very fundamental way, if they didn't cooperate, uh, the world could disintegrate into uh, anarchy. It was uh, informal uh, and non-institutionalized. Uh, the 21st century uh, idea of a concert, uh, as Chet mentioned in his opening remarks, has a lot more uh, variable geometry in terms of the participants who are involved in uh, promoting cooperative solutions to global order. Uh, you know, such ventures can be led uh, by middle powers, heads of international organizations, uh, heads of regional organizations, uh, and civil society uh, actors, but like the original concert, uh, to come to your question, uh, the parties work together informally in a pragmatic, uh, ad hoc manner outside of the arena of formal institutions or alliances uh, to promote new norms, rules of the road. Um, and, um, you know, I hasten to add that uh, it's not, not to protect the status quo as it was in the 19th century, uh, but to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, the peaceful and negotiated resolutions of dispute to avoid major great power uh, conflict. I think we see traces of concert diplomacy, if we're looking for an existence theorem, mm -hmm. in um, the efforts to negotiate the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. I mean, that was very much of a concert effort. Um, the multidimensional efforts that have involved civil society actors in the Colombian peace process, for example, uh, the development of the rapid response mechanism in the G7 to promote uh, information sharing on cyber attacks and threats to democracy. And perhaps most recently, um, and this is a, a Canadian partisan statement, the Canadian-led uh, effort, uh, which now uh, has involved 58 states who've uh, signed up to a declaration of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations, um, which is you know, partly directed at China, but China is not singled out in this. This is to develop a new norm that states should not uh, be in the business of taking uh, the citizens of other states uh, hostage. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic uh, that, uh, you know, this is a, uh, 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 a hammer that can be used for every uh, conflict nail that we face in the world. But, um, um, you know, as Chet has argued, there is an argument to be made for developing uh, a concert that involves 
uh, great powers as well um, uh, in uh, the continuing crisis in Yemen, uh, because there is a regional vacuum, as, uh, as Barbara mentioned. Um, that does require engagement in a constructive way, not a hands-off approach. Uh, in the Horn of Africa, um, the Central American migration crisis, which is the subject of uh, the Vice President and uh, Tony Blinken's trips, uh, uh, they have both argued for a regional approach uh, that involves uh, not just the Central American countries, but uh, the three amigos, let's get away from the Monroe Doctrine approach to dealing with these kinds of migration problems at, uh, at the border. And, uh, and arguably, as uh, as uh, Seng, uh, uh, you know, uh, mentioned that, you know, when it comes to territorial disputes in the South China Sea, which are driven by regional uh, power contests and national impulses, there does need to be a break there and the application of what we would call stabilization diplomacy in a concerted way, uh, in a concert way, to uh, prevent uh, the outcome that we all fear, uh, and that uh, you know some have said is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Thanks, Ben. Um, we have been having such a good time that I have neglected my, one of my most important responsibilities, which is to invite questions from our audience. And for that, I apologize, audience. And indeed, several of you have already placed questions in the chat. And if I might, let's let's turn to them and let's invite also our panelists to, uh, um, to be lightning in their responses to the questions that, are, that come up. The first uh, is from uh, Amos Olovatoye. He writes that despite the influence of global powers at the United Nations Security Council in promoting peace in Africa, what are the inclusive measures Africa needs to take to promote peace and security on its own? And uh, Solomon, may I ask you to lead us off on that? And perhaps uh, if you can in incorporate into that your thoughts about the current crisis in the Horn, that would be interesting. Th uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> As I indicated in uh, the chapter as well, I think um, how um, major global developments affect uh, peace and conflict diplomacy in Africa uh, depends not just uh, in how these developments inter uh, interact with uh, African situations, but also what African countries and institutions uh, do about uh, what is happening on the ground already. Uh, that matters a great deal. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, if you um, think of uh, various conflict situations, I think uh, what you find is um, what are the comparative advantages of uh, regional organizations such as the African Union, for example, in responding to uh, conflict situations. Uh, one is, um, you know, the issue of uh, proximity and the possibility of the African Union providing a platform for deliberation and uh, consensus building uh, among uh, the concerned actors um, and potentially articulating uh, an African Union uh, normative based uh, political proposal on how, uh, you know, particular conflict situations may be addressed. But this also depends on the nature of different conflict situations. So if you have, for example, what happened in Sudan in 2019, uh, following the ouster of uh, President Bashir, uh, with the seizure of power by the military, uh, and the risk associated with that of basically reversing uh, the clamor uh, and hope and expectation of the civilians uh, who played the lead role uh, that culminated in the ouster of Bashir, uh, the African Union um, had to deploy its normative uh, instruments in order basically to uh, push back uh, what would have been uh, the military's uh, ultimate uh, disruption of the transitional process in, in, in Sudan. Uh, and it used this exceptional norm which, which, which is the banning of unconstitutional chains of government or uh, seizure of power by the military. And in deploying that, it basically threw its weight behind the civilians who have been campaigning and clamoring for a civilian transitional process. Uh, 
uh, and thereby providing that avenue uh, for political negotiation, uh, which uh, was, among other things, uh, laid through the AU uh, Special Envoy for Sudan, uh, chosen by the chairperson of the commission, but importantly, with the participation of quite a number of actors, the US, um, European actors, um, Gulf countries, uh, the role of these different actors needed to be negotiated uh, in order to achieve uh, a semblance of uh, you know, uh, an agreement among the local actors on the course that the transition needs to take. Of course, it continues. To, it requires continuous engagement in order to sustain it, because the balance of power between the military and the civilians uh, is a very delicate one. If you have other conflict situations where much of the threat comes from non-state actors, often involving, for example, uh, terrorism, then you have a different kind of uh, approach emerging. Mm -hmm. This has to do with often security heavy, but it involves ad hoc coalitions of regional countries. It's not happening necessarily within the AU framework. It is basically countries of the region. For example, in the Sahel, the G5 Sahel that uh, uh, Jean-Marie made reference to. Exactly. In the lecture basin, uh, the MNJTF, the Multinational Joint Task Force, that is trying to control the uh, activities of Boko Haram because it has become a transnational and a transregional threat. Uh, for the regional countries. Um, this happened in the Central Africa region as well, where uh, the anti-LRA uh, uh, campaign was organized again on an ad hoc coalition of affected countries, uh, bringing their troops. Often the challenge with this is, as has been said by Jean-Marie again, is it hasn't been premised on and uh, supported by a political uh, framework and that is where i think uh, the challenge comes uh, and what the african union uh, has been trying to do is basically without that kind of political framework and a norm-based engagement uh, dealing with the issues that created the space for these actors it would be difficult to actually get out of this situation yeah, very. And and if I may come to the Horn of Africa situation, ju just one thing to say, which is, um, it may be the case that there could be an instance in which the AU may find itself in uh, a position of paralysis uh, in terms of basically uh, really achieving a political consensus among its uh, member states uh, and even um, initiatives taking off the ground even if those initiatives can. Uh, and in that kind of situation, I think uh, obviously it's difficult to imagine that political so solutions would come from outside uh, as far as the political resolution of conflicts is concerned. Mm -hmm. What one hopes for is what I call containing and limiting the evil that is, that, that, that is violence mm -hmm. and the humanitarian disasters that comes with it. And, but that doesn't give you the political solution. And it, it falls back on African actors, regional organizations, and the AU, therefore, uh, one way or another, uh, to uh, assume responsibility for that. But the unfortunate thing is, we are in a time on the African continent where we suffer from a dearth of leadership across the board. Uh, and, and that has created uh, this uh, uh, ineffective uh, or lack of engagement, effective engagement, uh, despite the existence of uh, the African Union infrastructure for conflict and peace diplomacy. So I want to thank you for that. That's a topic that we, to which we could devote an entire session on its own, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to do that. I want to get a couple of quick more questions here before we wrap up. William Flavin, this is for Jean-Marie. Um, Jamri, you talked about the role of other actors in this conflict and peace space. And William Flavin asked, can you speak to the impact of transnational criminal actors, including cyber criminals, on the practice of peace and conflict diplomacy? And I'd also note that 
sometimes difficult to dis to distinguish the criminal actors from the from the um, ideologically motivated actors. Yes, I want to transition uh, with what Solomon was uh, saying. Actually, in the Sahel, you have uh, transnational actors who sometimes connect with criminal agendas. Uh, uh, in drug trafficking, arms, traffic, <coughs> arms trafficking, uh, people trafficking, uh, we see all of that. Uh, and I think that the fundamental challenge uh, that these new actors pose to uh, conflict management and conflict resolution is that they have no real interest in full peace. Mm -hmm. They don't want full war because full war is not good uh, for their business but uh, full peace would not be good for their business either. So this gray area where you have uh, weak, permanently weak states suits them perfectly. Uh, and uh, any negotiation becomes very difficult because we, we work usually traditionally on the assumption that uh, when you negotiate, you negotiate about power, you negotiate about an end state that means peace. But the best end state for criminal actors is a state of neither peace, nor war. No, I think that you're right. Uh, they, they certainly further complexify and complicate this whole landscape of peacemaking, peace building. If you've got actors who frankly are benefiting from the conflict, but don't mm -hmm. want to see it get totally out of hand, how do you manage that? I think we're going to... Sometimes in, in the Sahel, you see that one day you have a, a caravan of traffickers that works with the enemies of the government, and the next day it works with some parts of the government. Uh, so it, it does complicate things terribly. It does indeed. Uh, dear panelists, I want to thank you. Uh, I wish we had another hour. <laughs> I'm sure we could easily fill that hour with um, your, your insightful observations. But um, I hope that what we have done at least is uh, to highlight the, the importance of this book and its contribution to our understanding of peace and conflict diplomacy. I'm going to stop there and, and invite uh, Pamela All to uh, share with us her her thoughts, reflections on both on the book, but more importantly on the conversation we just had. Pamela, over to you. Thank you. Well, I am just uh, going to um, start by saying thank you to everyone. This was an excellent panel. I wish books themselves were a bit more interactive so we could have had this conversation all the time when we were, were writing uh, the book. But this has been excellent. And Barbara, thank you for, for joining us and bringing mm -hmm. your perspective as well. And George, as always, wonderful um, moderating. Uh, a very complex set of, of questions. I just want to, to leave this, um, this room with, um, to, by emphasizing one of the thoughts that has been recurring throughout everyone's uh, talk. Um, and uh, that is really um, the changing nature of diplomacy in terms of who does it. Um, you know, the, the, the days of, of state-based diplomacy, they're not over, but they're, they're decreasing in number where you just have groups of states coming together and deciding things. The days of states working with intergovernmental institutions like the UN, um, they're not decreasing, but they're certainly becoming uh, more complex. Um, particularly with the entrance of regional organizations into the mix that may be playing constructive roles or as we heard from Barbara, perhaps uh, playing not constructive roles in, in the conflict. So you're already starting with a, a much more complex playing field. And um, in our idea of concert, which Fenn talked about um, and uh, uh, Chet also mentioned in terms of variable um, diplomacy, um, we envision a place for uh, many other actors. In fact, we think it's very, very important that we introduce room for uh, NGOs, local civil society, associations, business, 
to also have a voice in this diplomacy. So going to this idea of a concert and an orchestra, it may mean that some people in the orchestra, some chairs in the orchestra are going to have to shove over to make room for these new voices. Uh, and it may mean that we're all going to have to learn new pieces. And I'm thinking, uh, saying about the horses and the cows, maybe they're going to have to learn how to harmonize um, instead of insisting on their own identity. Um, one thing is for sure is that it's not going to get easier. We're, we're going to be introducing uh, a level of complexity that we haven't seen yet. And I think that's perhaps, um, it, it's, it's not, I, I don't want to end this on a down note. In fact, I think this might be an up note. Um, but it's something that we have to, uh, in fact, be ready for. Um, uh, diplomacy won't become easier. It will become more complicated, but um, with with um, you know good uh, orchestration and perhaps you know co-conducting of several conductors, uh, we may get to the point where, in fact, um, peace and conflict diplomacy, which which uh, includes all these different actors, um, it is in fact more effective than it's been in the past. But um, thank you to everyone, and thank you to USIP for offering us this chance um, to all be together. And um, thank you to our audience, um, and look forward to hearing from you um, soon in the future.